And I'm going to ask one more short prayer as we go into our sermon. Jesus, would you come and teach us from your word? Would you work through this room today in our hearts through your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So have you ever observed someone working a room? You know what I mean by working a room? Uh, a few years ago, I had a friend who was running for a political office, and so I was invited to some event. And of course, all the right people from the various um, parts of the party that that person was a part of had to be there, and certain dignitaries and people of notoriety. And um, I remember watching these politicians working the room, you know, they're, they're glad handing and slapping backs, and they got to shake the hands of the important people. They can ignore the not important people. Nobody was seeking me out to shake my hand. I was a nobody. I didn't matter. But it was fun watching them. Someone will work a room for politics. Somebody will work a room for business advantage. You know, I, I've known people that come to church not because they necessarily want to meet Jesus, but it's good business. And you can meet people in the lobby and they're, they're working the room. We've spent four previous Sabbaths talking about a passage starting in Luke chapter 14, verse 1. And we've spent some time, even uh, three different Sabbaths, spent some time talking about the whole issue of Sabbath keeping, which is at the core of this passage. But I noticed something about this passage that I want to look at today as we kind of finish our time on this passage. There aren't very many places, in fact, I haven't found another one yet, where Jesus does as many things in one place at one time as he does here. Usually you have a story that he heals somebody and he moves on and then he preaches something and he moves on. But Jesus, at this lunch at the Pharisee's house, he works the room. And he does it amazingly. Let's look at the story. It happened. As Jesus went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees, we've already noted before that this was a top dog Pharisee, a top of the heap Pharisee, one who was in charge, the Pharisee, the first Pharisee, the Pharisee in the head. That as Jesus went into the house of the ruler of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, so this is Sabbath lunch at the Pharisee's house, that they watched him closely. Now we know that the Pharisees were not Jesus' friends. They were his enemies. So Jesus has accepted an invitation to have lunch at the house of somebody who's not even really friendly towards him. Jesus goes wherever he's invited, even if the scenery isn't that great. Aren't you glad for that? If you invite Jesus into your heart, he'll come. Even if you have problems and addictions and brokenness and you're all messed up. And you've been messed up for a long time. He doesn't care how long you've been messed up, how bad you've been messed up. He doesn't, isn't worried about whether you're friendly or not friendly. If you invite him in, he'll come over for lunch. Amen? You don't have to wonder if he's going to come to your place if you send out the invitation. He will show up. I know I've gotten some invitations over the years to go places where I felt like, do, do I really want to say yes to this invitation or not? Now, it wasn't your house, I promise. But you know, we've all had invitations to parties we weren't sure we wanted to go to and events we sh weren't sure. Is anybody going to be there that I want to be with? This is not a friendly environment. Now it says there was a certain man there who had dropsy. So there's a sick man present. That's a setup we've seen. And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees. So now what we know about the setting is that Jesus is invited to the house of one of the chief of the Pharisees. He invites all his fellow Pharisees and all the lawyers that backed up the Pharisees because the Pharisees believed you were going to get to heaven by keeping the law correctly and exactly. And so they had a whole bunch of lawyers that helped explain the law and expand on the law because if you're going to be a legalist, you're going to need a lawyer, right? So Jesus walks into this hostile environment 
of a whole group of men who want his destruction. But he's invited, he shows up. Even if the motives aren't right, he shows up, amen? I don't think he'd have come into any of our hearts if he'd have waited to make sure our motives were right. He comes in if we invite. Now, I want you to notice verse 3 says, and Jesus answering. Now, what is he answering? Has anybody said anything yet? Nobody said a word. He comes into the house. They're all watching him. They've got this sick man they've invited on purpose because they're hoping if Jesus doesn't heal the sick man, they can claim he's not compassionate. And if he does heal him, they'll blame him for Sabbath breaking. According to their rules, by the way, we've looked at it, not the Bible's rules. And it says Jesus answering. Nobody asked anything. How can you answer when nobody's asked? It's a very interesting word for answer. It's the little preposition from, apo in the Greek, from. And then it's the word to judge. The word used all through the New Testament for judging. From judging. Strange word. I thought about it. It's a word that doesn't necessarily just mean to give a verbal answer when somebody gives a verbal statement like we would think of. But it means from judging the circumstances, you respond accordingly. You get that? So Jesus reads the room. He sees the setup. They've got the token sick man there. They are watching him. Nobody's saying a word. He's walked into a hostile room and he reads the room and from discerning, from judging the situation, he begins to speak. And all he does is ask a question. He asks the question that they're all sitting around thinking about. Is it lawful to do good? Is it lawful to heal, that is, on the Sabbath? Their laws say it isn't. They know he's healed on the Sabbath a number of times, and they want to catch him in something they can discredit him. So he simply, I like the way Jesus doesn't tippy-toe around the situation. He dives right in. Okay, guys, I got the setup. I can see what you've done. Now, I'm asking you, is it lawful for me to heal this guy today? Well, they weren't about to answer. They wanted to catch him, not him catch them. So it says, they kept silent. They didn't move. So Jesus took the man, meaning literally he went over and took a hold of the man and healed him. That would be amazing, right? That should get their attention at least. They couldn't do that. The doctors couldn't do that. But this man who's all bloated from dropsy, from, from retention of fluid, is just fine. He's healed. And Jesus sends him away. He didn't want to be there anyway. They were using him. Jesus healed him and sent him away, released him from the situation. Now, again, nobody said anything yet, right? But Jesus, again, answered, responded to the situation, judged the room, and said, which of you having a donkey or an ox that's fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And we already noted that in two other situations similar to this, Jesus used the animal versus person illustration. If you, you lead your donkey or ox out to water, you pull them out of the ditch, you take care of your animals on the Sabbath, you treat animals better than you do people. All Jesus does is ask two questions. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And which of you, when his donkey or ox has fallen into a pit, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And once again, they didn't say a word. Jesus walks in. He sizes up the room. He does what he needs to do. He has compassion on the man and heals him. He does it whether that will cause him to be condemned by them or not. He's not worried about his standing with them. He's more interested in taking care of a sick person and giving them evidence that he's more than just a man. And they couldn't answer regarding these things. So notice who's done all the talking so far. 
They've been silent. Jesus has asked two questions. They're still silent. Well, what do you do when it's silent? Jesus tells a story. So he told them a parable to those who were invited. Jesus now turns to all the guests, those other Pharisees and lawyers, when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, notice he didn't say a Sabbath lunch, he said a wedding feast. He kind of gave it a little distance. Do not sit down at the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him, and he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man, and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. Jesus, without saying it, says, you've been watching me, but guess what? I've been watching you. Do you guys realize what I watched you doing? Do you even know what you're up to when you come in? You walk into a room, and I see you all trying to maneuver yourself to the most important place at the table. And given his illustration, I'll bet it happened. While Jesus was watching, he noticed the one man who'd gotten himself at a high position at the table, and they had a very definite pecking order of who sat where at these tables back then. They were very conscious of that status. It looks like Jesus is probably watching, and some guy goes in and sees a blank seat near the head of the table, and he goes and sits in there, and a few minutes later, the host comes by and taps him on the shoulder and says, uh, this place is reserved for this guy. I'm going to have to ask you to move. Have you ever gotten on an airplane and sat in the wrong seat? I've seen it happen. I haven't done it, praise the Lord. Marilyn and I were up in Canada for the last couple of weeks. We did a camp meeting for a weekend and got to spend some time at a cabin out on a lake. Uh, for some vacation, it was very cool and very alone and very quiet. The bears and the eagles and the various animals, it was fun. But going back and forth from here to Vancouver, British Columbia, I flew on one of those airlines where they assign a seat. I'm usually on Southwest when I go somewhere and you just scramble for a seat, right? But they have assigned seats. I've, I've, I've seen it before, I didn't see it this time, where somebody you know, somebody's walking down there looking for their seat. They got their ticket out and they're looking and, and then they look and then they read the sign and then they look again and they call the, the, the uh, not supposed to call the stewardess anymore. What is it? Flight attendant. Thank you. They call the flight attendant and pretty soon somebody says, sir, what is your seat number? And of course, then he, uh, I think you're in the wrong seat. It's embarrassing, isn't it? You have to get up and move everything. Well, it wasn't an accident here. Jesus sees them trying to self-promote. Isn't that what most people are doing when they're working a room? They're trying to self-promote. And Jesus says, um, I watched what you all were doing. You know, it's, it's, like, it's kind of like a parent watching kids. The kids think they're sneaking around and getting away with something, and you can see the whole thing the whole time. You wonder what they're thinking. They think they've got it figured out, and they don't. Jesus says, I watched how you acted in this room. Everybody trying to self-promote as much as possible and get to the highest position. Now, he says, let me give you some advice. And they didn't ask for it. He just gives it. When you're invited, go sit in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, come up higher. I got a, reserve, I got a seat reserved for you up higher here. Then you with glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you will move up to that seat. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. I find it interesting. Jesus looks around and he says, I can see what you guys are into. You're into status, you're into position. But even from a, just a human standpoint, forget religion and God in heaven, you're going about it all wrong. Because you push to the top and you get embarrassed. Why not sit down a little lower and get invited up? But Jesus is also teaching them about the kingdom of God. Remember, we've talked about it. 
The economy of heaven is based on service and giving. And that's all it was, is service and giving. We talked about the, we've talked about the mad scramble to the bottom to lift each other up. Everyone is scrambling down to lift. And if everybody's going down to lift, everybody's getting lifted all the time. You go down to lift, the next thing you know, somebody's lifting you. Somebody. That's the economy of heaven. You give everything away. Constantly. Whatever you have, you give it away. You don't try to hoard it. You give it away, and somebody else is giving it away. So everybody's giving. Every, everybody has more than they can handle because it's being showered on them constantly, and they're giving it away. You talk about a fluid economy. Things are moving. Until this guy named Lucifer came along and thought he had a better idea on how to run the universe, and he said, I will exalt myself. I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. He said, if you want to really live, you can find more life scrambling for power and control than going with service and love. And if you read Ezekiel 28, it says it's going to, he's going to end up in ashes. What goes up must come down. But Jesus says what goes down will be lifted up. And of course, the opposite of Lucifer was Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. This isn't just how Jesus acts. This is what his mind is is all about. It may work externally to pick a lower place knowing you'll get invited up instead of sent down. But what really matters in the kingdom of God is what's happening in your heart, in your mind. Is this naturally who you are or have become? That you have become a giving person. You don't just act like a giving person. A lot of us are grasping for power and control. You know, we're all control freaks. I didn't hear an amen on that one. We are all control freaks. We are all convinced that if we were in charge of things, things would be better. Aren't we? And so we come to church, and we know things are different than that, so we try to act submissive. <laughs> we try to act service-oriented, and yet our control stuff leaks through all over the place, doesn't it? Now, let this mind be in you that is the mind of Jesus. This is who Jesus is. He's not acting. He's being himself, who being in the form of God, and he was God, that's himself, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. That's himself. He's God. He can say, I'm equal with God because he is God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity. He is, he is God. So it wasn't robbery for him to be in the Godhead. It wasn't something he was taking that wasn't his. But he made himself of no reputation. He had a reputation. He's God. But he set that reputation aside, taking the form of a bondservant or a slave, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So you see Jesus being who he is, not trying to act out, not trying to do some PR stunt to to, to give us an impression, just being who he is. He steps from being God to becoming a human. That's from infinite to finite. That would be something like you and I choosing to become a mosquito or a cockroach or a slug. I would go to see my grandma up in the northwest, the rainy side of Washington state, and these big old green banana slugs, oh, you step on them, you slide halfway down the mountain. You know, ugly. It would be less of a condescension for us to become one of those than for God to become one of us. But he steps down, takes on our skin, 
And not only that, he doesn't come as an upper class uh, aristocrat, prince, king. He's born of the lowest class, in a barn, a pauper, no status on this earth at all. Beyond that, he becomes obedient to the demands of things, and he becomes obedient even to death and the worst death possible. You can't step any lower. Jesus got low enough that there's nobody lower than where he got. Which means it doesn't matter how low you've gotten in your life, he went lower, he's got his hand under you to pick you up. Amen? He went all the way to the bottom. Talk about somebody hitting bottom. He went all the way down. You can't hit a bottom lower than his bottom. And he went to the bottom and he will lift us up. Therefore, now remember, this is who God is. It's not God play acting. It's not God trying to make an impression. It's not God trying to teach you something. It's God being God. He's a giver. He's a lover. And love goes all the way down to lift. But then it says, verse 9, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What goes up must come down. Lucifer said, I will rule, I will reign, I will be like, and God says, that's going to turn you to ashes. Jesus says, I will go all the way down to ashes, and he is king of kings and lord of lords. Amen? That's how things work. Every nation that rises falls. Every person that goes up eventually comes down. They may even be a celebrity till they die, but when, they're, when they die, guess what? They're dead. It's over. That's all the world can offer you, by the way. Don't forget that, folks. The only thing the world can offer you is a dead end. It may offer you some bangles and baubles and a little bit of excitement and a few things on the way, but in the end, you're dead. But Jesus says, my economy, where you go down to lift, you'll end up alive. Amen? So Jesus looks at these guys who are all jockeying for first position, and he says, first of all, guys, wake up. It's not working. <laughs> Secondly, it's not how the kingdom of God works. And you claim to be the Pharisees, the, 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 the keepers of the kingdom of God. You claim that you're the ones that if everybody follow you and do it, you're the A-list for the kingdom of God. And in reality, you're acting just the opposite Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So Jesus walks in the room, and the first thing he does in working the room is he heals the guy that's sick and sends him away. Then he turns to those that were invited, like him, to the feast or to the lunch, and he says, you ought to consider functioning a little different than you are because it's not working and it's not God's way, and you claim to be God's guys. So why don't you try the down-up thing instead of the up-down? But Jesus isn't finished. Now he turns to the host. He also said to him who invited him, the ruler of the Pharisees. And sir, when you give a dinner or a supper like today, don't ask your friends, your brothers, and your relatives and the rich people like you have today, lest they invite you back and you be repaid. But let me suggest something Jesus says. When you, when you give a feast, a dinner, a lunch, Invite the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind, all the ones you think aren't worthy, and the ones who won't give you status by inviting them, and the ones who can't reciprocate, try inviting them, and you will be blessed. The word blessed there means fortunate. Really. You'll be more fortunate inviting the hurting and the homeless over than the uh, well-placed A-list people. Well, not in this world, but you'll be repaid in the resurrection of the just. 
of the righteous. In other words, what's the righteous thing to do? So Jesus now looks at his host and says, you know what God would have you do? The, the, the God that you claim to be following all the rules and be on the A-list for, for him, uh, the God that you claim to be the teachers about and the theologians about, that God, if you're really following him, who he wants you to invite are not these people here that I just talked to about that were jockeying for first place. The ones he wants you to invite are the down and the out and the hurting. Like the guy that I healed and sent away. That's who you should fill your house with. If you want to really be doing life God's way and you claim to be the teachers of God's way, this would be God's way. So, at this point, has anybody else at lunch said anything? Nobody's had a, got a word in edgewise. Well, he's given them a chance. He asks a question, there's silence. He asks another question, there's silence. He tells a story, there's silence. He turns to the host. Nobody has said anything yet. If you were in this room, would you be able to feel the tension. Jesus has not been making friends, but he's been handing out advice whether they want it or not. I know when I get in these kind of situations, I want to say something that will break the ice, right? Something that'll cut through the tension and lighten things up and get everybody on a more jovial uh, communication level. And I think that's exactly what somebody finally did. Notice Jesus said, if you invite the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind, you will be what? What's the word? You'll be blessed. And you'll be repaid, not in this world. You'll lose money here but you'll re be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now, when you think of the resurrection of the righteous, what do you think of? Jesus is going to come. We're all going to be raised. We're going to go to heaven, and things are going to be good. And won't it be wonderful, and I mean it seriously, won't it be wonderful when we can gather around that great table in heaven when all the pain and trouble is past and all before us is good? And we are with Jesus, and we're with each other, and we're actually able to get along. We've been fully transformed into perfection again, and we're headed for Eden. Won't that be wonderful? And I think somebody had that going through their mind. Because when Jesus says, you'll be blessed, you, they can't repay you now, but you'll be repaid in the resurrection of the just. And somebody who sat at the table with him heard these things and said, blessed is he who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. This kind of bursting forth of words. Won't it be good? Won't it be wonderful? You said we'll be fortunate if we invite the maimed and the lame. And we'll be fortunate when we're sitting around the great table in the kingdom of God. And finally, Messiah has come and all is well. Amen? So the guy kind of bursts in with this statement i think he's trying to break the ice loosen up the tension yeah won't it be great when we're all sitting around having that great meal in the kingdom of god yeah and jesus said to him so now jesus speaks to that person it's in the singular him jesus said to him well let me tell you a story a certain man gave a great supper, and he invited many. So this is a big deal, right? A great supper, not a little supper. And he invites many. In fact, at that great supper, ultimately, there's a seat at the table for everyone. Amen? He invited many. You know, I have, I, I don't mean to pick on a, 
on a subject here that create an argument, but you know, I know people who, who believe that the 144,000 is a specific number. Then I'm just hoping I'm not the 144,000th and one who wants in. There's no room, right? There's a great multitude that no one can number. I like that. There's room at the table for everyone. God isn't going to say, whoops, house is full. Sorry. It's a great supper, and he invites. And the word invite there is simply the Greek word to call. He calls many. In fact, he calls all. But back to the parable. A certain man held a great supper and invited many. He had his A-list, and he had them all invited. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, for all things are now ready. Now, if you were putting on a great supper, you told everyone, you know, you're going to have this big party. It's going to be a certain time, a certain place. But I will send a reminder just ahead of time. Wouldn't you expect that the people on your A-list that you've invited would be anticipating the event, maybe even have prepared and dressed up and are all ready to go and are just waiting for the final summons? Seems like that's what A-list people would do. Go out, servant, and tell the people, come, it's time. My dinner is ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said, I bought a piece of ground. I must go and see it. Please have me excused. I got a real estate deal going down. And I need to stick with that right now. I don't have time to come to dinner because I have some important business matters. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. Don't you test drive the tractor before you buy it? He's got a farm. He's bought some farm equipment. And he says, I got to go check it out. So please have me excused. I've, I've got some business to do. That's more important than coming to the supper. And a third one said, I've married a wife. Literally, I've married a woman. The Bible's pretty clear on that. Men marry women and women marry men. We still believe that. And there isn't a word for wife in the New Testament. In the New Testament, it's simply his woman or her man. Not very feminist. But we do belong to each other when we're married. And it's a sweet belonging. Amen? I married a woman. Therefore, I cannot come. Well, why doesn't he bring her along? I'm sure she was invited too. If you've got a wife, you can bring her to the party. Now, are any of these people doing anything bad? You know, none of them, none of them have said, I've committed a murder and I've got to run for my life, therefore I cannot come. You know, I've stolen 10 chickens and I've got to take care of them. I cannot come. You know, I've committed adultery. I'm not worthy. I cannot come. There's nothing bad here going on. This, it, it's, these aren't people who decide not to come because they're too bad. They're too busy doing perfectly good things. Is there anything wrong with picking up a piece of real estate? No, I moved here and got to buy my first house 26 and a half years ago. We paid it off a couple of years ago. I'm glad. And we've kind of been, you know, we're getting near retirement age. Not sure what to do about that yet. Marilyn and I were thinking about trying to buy a little piece of property somewhere, a little higher elevation, looking towards the future. It's interesting. We found a spot in area we liked, and it was affordable. Found a couple of lots that we liked. And uh, I remember Marilyn said one Sunday morning, she said, you know, I've been praying about this. I wish we could have some closure. I'd like to move forward. I said, well, let's drive up there and see what happens. So we drove up there, and we looked at the two pieces, and we decided we wanted, you know, parcel B. It was our favorite. So we uh, called up the realtor, and he said, oh, that just got pulled off the market. Oh, okay. So we went over to parcel A, called up the owners. They said, we don't want to sell. I told Marilyn, I think we have closure. <laughs> I think God slammed those doors pretty good. But there's nothing wrong with looking for a piece of property. Nothing wrong with owning a home, owning a farm. Uh, that's a good thing. 
Uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with having a good tractor for your farm, right? Five yoke of oxen. There's nothing wrong with these things. Nothing wrong with getting married. In fact, we probably need a little more of that, a little less shacking up. So the problem isn't here that they're out doing evil things that make them unworthy to come to the dinner. The problem is they're too busy with this stuff that they don't have in their life priority for coming to the dinner that they were invited to. It's all a matter of priorities. So the servant came and reported these things to the master and the master of the house being angry. Is it okay for the master of the house to be angry? Have you ever planned a big party and invited a bunch of people and most of them didn't show up? I've actually gotten after you in this church a few times over the years. We've done a couple, three events over the years where we did a lot of planning, a lot of decorating, a lot of food preparation, a lot of work. And we had y'all sign up to come to the event. And we'd have, I remember once we had like 150 people signed up. This was going to be a great church event. And only 75 of you showed up. Now, I mean 150 of you signed up. So we prepared for 150. And only half of you came. I was a little angry at you. Some other people were too, did a lot of work. So I've told you in the future events now, I've said, if you're going to sign up, please show up. And if you change your mind, let us know. I mean, it doesn't mean you go out and hit somebody or mean to anybody, but it's kind of maddening. He got this big party ready. The A-list is all out. The invitations have gone out. And then he invites those A-list people to come, and they're all too busy doing other things. He was angry. And he said to the servant, go out quickly. Food's all ready. Let's move. Into the streets and lanes of the city. Go out right around the banquet hall. And bring in, guess who? The same four he mentioned earlier to the host. The poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Bring them in. You mean they're invited? Yes. And notice it doesn't say invite them. It actually says lead them in. It's very specific in the Greek. Don't just tell them they're welcome. Lead them in. Go, they don't think they're worthy. They don't think the invitation's for them. They're not A-listers. They don't think they belong. Go out and lead them in. Grab them by the hand and say, come on, there's a place for you. Let's go. It's going to be good food. It's going to be great. You are invited. Come on. No, I, I don't know where to go. I, I, come on, come on. Lead them in. There's a lot of people, folks, that don't think they're eligible or worthy for the banquet. But everybody is. And if we've accepted the invitation and we're servants of the, of the banquet master, he wants us to go out and let people know they're eligible, they're worthy, and lead them in. The servant said, Master, it's done as you commanded. There's still room. Oh, that's good news, isn't there? There's still room. If you haven't come yet, there's still room. And the master said to the servant, go into the highways and hedges. Now go out of town into the countryside. And I just, when I read this highways and hedges, I, I, I got to go to Britain once and spend a couple weeks. And I remember in our rental car, driving on the wrong side, sitting on the wrong side, trying to figure out how to stay on the wrong side of the road, driving down these little lanes in the country. I deliberately drive off the big highway and down the little lanes. And you're driving between these hedgerows that are centuries old, you know, rock piles from where they pulled the rocks over the centuries off the, off the land to cultivate it. And then they've grown hedges and, and you're, you're, you're driving down these, you can't see anything because you're in between these hedges, but
but it's the country out there. And it's like Jesus, or it's like the, 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 the leader of the, the, the master of the feast says, go out into the highways and the hedges, go out into the countryside, beat the bushes, and compel them to come in, urge them to come in. I don't think it means force them, but it's a forceful word. Urge them to come in, that my house may be filled. Now, I've been hanging out around church things for many, many years, decades, all my life. I was raised in church. And I don't know about you, but there are times that I've felt like what I've heard preached and what I've heard shared with me, that God is up in heaven watching us. Oops, got him, you're out. Oop, big mistake, you're out. Have you felt that way? Almost as if God is trying to see how many he can keep out. This tells me just the opposite. He says, go out and bring them in, drag them in, get them in. I want my house full. Don't miss that, people. God wants you in. He's doing everything to get you in. I'm convinced in the long run, the only people that will ultimately be lost will be those who repeatedly and strenuously refuse God's repeated and strenuous attempts to get them in. He wants his house full, not empty. He's trying to get you in, not keep you out. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited or called will taste my supper. The A-list is going to be missing. But why is the A-list missing? Is it because they were bad? No. It's simply because they didn't make a priority of coming to the feast. What makes you worthy to get into this feast? And there is something that makes you worthy. Don't say nothing. What makes you worthy? The fact that you decide to come. That's it. If you decide to come, you're worthy. And if you don't know the way, he'll send someone out to lead you in. And if you're a little hesitant, he'll some, send someone out to urge you. Because he wants his house full. And the only thing that makes us unworthy is if we're too busy to show up. And that's not really the biggest issue of, the, are we too bad to come? The issue is, are we too preoccupied with stuff that will rust and burn here on this earth that we don't have time to come to the eternal feast? You know, Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's knocking at the door. He's not waiting for us to knock at his door. He's forward. He's knocking at the door. And we'll get everything if we just open the door. We'll get nothing if we don't open the door. It's not about being good and bad or bad. It's about being willing to take the time to sit down with Jesus. Do I have time on a daily basis to put Jesus first or am I too busy to put Jesus first? And if Jesus isn't first, you're dead. Jesus has to be first. You shall have no other gods before me. He doesn't want to be the top of the list. He wants to be the only one on the list. Even if you miss that real estate deal and you don't get that special deal on that tractor and even if you miss that marriage, you got to come to Jesus first and let everything come second. So I like watching Jesus work this room. He comes in, first priority, heal the poor sick guy. Send him on. Next, he deals with the invitees and their jockeying proposition and talks about how the kingdom of God works through a parable. And then he turns to the host and he says, you know, if you really want to get in with God, Here's, you, here's who you should invite because this is who's on his mind. And somebody says, oh, won't it be great when we're all together around the big table in the kingdom? And Jesus says, yeah. And the direction you all are headed, none of you are going to be there. 
When Jesus works the room, he doesn't work the room to gain status for himself. He works the room to gain status for others. He's trying to get all these guys into the kingdom, and he's being pretty direct about it. This is pretty late in his ministry. He only has a few weeks of life left on this earth. And we see, as we've talked about, that the, his rhetoric, his urgency ratchets up during the last few months and especially weeks, and especially the last week of his life on earth. He's laying the ax at the root of the tree. He's letting these guys who think they're the A-list for the kingdom of God know that they're not even going to be there if they don't change some priorities. How they're living their lives in terms of status and power and busyness and all of that means nothing to God. What matters to God is if you're willing to show up for dinner. I stand at the door and knock, and if you hear my voice, open the door. I'll come in and we'll dine. Do we have time to dine daily with Jesus? He puts on a great dinner every day. And when he works the room, he's not working for self-promotion. He's working for kingdom promotion and getting you in because he wants his house full. So I have a question today. Has God been working this room today? Has he gotten around to you yet? I don't know what out of these four little parables and these four events as Jesus works in this room. I don't know what's spoken to your heart, but I'll bet something has spoken to your heart about priorities, about putting Jesus first, maybe about your own control issues, maybe about your attitude about God and salvation. I don't know what it is. But has God worked the room? Has the Holy Spirit worked the room and spoken to your heart today? If he has, I'm going to ask you to do something. If God has said something specific to your heart as he worked the room this morning, and you want to respond to it, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come down here to the front, and we're just going to pray. I don't know why you're going to come, but I believe God's been working the room, and if you feel in your heart right now that you need to do something specific to respond to what God has been saying to you in the last half hour, I invite you to just get up and come down to the front right now. I won't make you talk. I won't make you talk. But I want to give you a chance to come to the supper, so to speak, in some kind of a specific way. Whatever your thing is that God has been speaking to your heart, just come on down. Come around to the sides. Come in close. I'll give you a moment. You know exactly what it is that God has been saying to your heart. And by walking down here, you are simply saying, God, I'm listening. I want to respond. I want to show up. I want to show up for what you're calling me to right now. All right, give just another minute. Now, you're all close to, come in, come in tighter, come in tighter, come on in, come on in. Um, I want to ask you just put your hands on each other's shoulders, kind of get connected, we're all, we're all going to just touch one another. And let's pray. Jesus, you know intimately everyone who's come up here today and you know exactly what you said to their heart in the last half hour and why they've come up. And Jesus, I ask you right now that whatever it is, you'll burn it in their hearts, you'll write it in the books of heaven, and you'll remind them of it tomorrow. That whatever shape it is, Lord, we know that it involves at least one thing. It involves putting you first 
in some area that you may not have been first yet. Surrendering to you. Choosing to give up our control trips. Asking for the mind of Jesus that we'll, uh, that you'll so transform us that we will naturally become servants and lifters up of others instead of control freaks. Lord, whatever it is in each person's heart that got up and came down here, would you please speak that truth into their hearts? Holy Spirit, come and do a transforming work. Let us be different than when we walked in here today. However slight or big that difference is, let there be a difference as we exit today to walk closer with you, to ask you to continue to transform us, to ask you to shift our priorities to the priorities of heaven and to give us the mind of Christ. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.